to their futures. Soldiers speak out. Welcome to the Veterans Hour, a monthly program offered by Veterans for Peace, Chapter 109 from Olympia, Washington. Our theme song that you just heard, Soldiers Speak Out, tells it all. We are veterans speaking out with our own authentic voices. Veterans for Peace is a global organization of military veterans and allies whose collective efforts are to build a culture of peace by using our experiences and lifting our voices. We inform the public of the true costs of war and the enormous costs of war with the obligation to heal wounds of war. We appreciate Thurston Community Media for giving a voice to veterans on Comcast Channel 22. We also appreciate KAOS 89.3 with John Ford's Once More Into the Breach. This month for Veterans Hour, I'm chatting with Mark Fleming, a Vietnam veteran and secretary of Veterans for Peace, Chapter 109. Mark has just published his second book, Reluctant Soldier, Uneasy Veteran, A Year in Vietnam and Beyond. His first book, published in 2011, At the Speed of Foot, Res Dog on the Appalachian Trail, was a journey of self-discovery as an infantry rifleman in Vietnam. And in that book, Mark, you wrote, I needed to walk in peace after walking in war. One thing I noticed, Mark, is that both you and I desperately used our college deferments to avoid the draft. It didn't work out for me. What happened to you? Well, same, same thing that happened to you is I used my college deferments. I had all four years, and when I graduated, the war was still there. And I'd not really made any plans. And facing the draft, I just decided, you know, I'm stuck with this. Let's, I'm somebody, if I have a difficult task and I know I can't get out of it, I just say, get it behind me. So I just went down and said, I'll go in for two years. I didn't wait for them to draft me. I just and said, that was the time that you could enlist for two years. Yeah. And I think, okay, I'm a college graduate. What, what, how bad could it be? But if I remember right, if you enlisted for two years, you couldn't choose your MOS. Exactly. So I was your put, military occupation specialty. Was, I was rolling the dice. And I enlisted because, uh, and that was for three years, because I could choose my military occupation mm -hmm. specialty. And they even said for one year, you can have the place where you want to go for a guaranteed year. And during Vietnam, that seemed like a pretty good thing. Yeah. So I, I say I, I, I took a chance. I figured, well, I can, I can end up in a decent position and not really be at risk. And it turned out that was a, that was not the right decision. There you go. And at that point, yeah, I just, I acceded to it. Well, your first book, At the Speed of Foot, Res Dog on the Appalachian Trail. Uh, res Dog. What's yeah. that referring to? Uh, res Dog is a generic name for a stray dog on the. Uh, on an Indian reservation, and I, before I went on the Appalachian Trail, I'd worked for five years on the Navajo reservation, and saw a lot of res dogs, and they're homeless, they're making, getting out as best they can, and when you're walking six months on the Appalachian Trail, you're doing something like that. Well, and that book was part of a healing experience for you. What motivated you to write this new book yeah. that just came out? Well, actually, this you know, this book has been in the works pretty much since the day I was in Vietnam. I said, I, I wanna, I'm going to write something about this. So, and not long after I got back, in the mid-70s, I started putting together, I was going to write short stories, I was going to write the great novel, or, but none of the stories seemed to really work out that well for me. And I, so I was kind of, well, put down your memories. So I just wrote a lot of the memories. And this went on for decades. I can, never could really think of what to do with it. And that's where, doing the Appalachian Trail, you know, it really forced me to think about it because in all those intervening years, I could put any thoughts about Vietnam aside. I, you know, I had career, marriage, just getting on with life. In Vietnam, yeah, I just decide. Get on the trail for eight hours a day, pretty much by myself, 
you know, walking in the woods carrying a pack. I mean, in speed of foot, I'd describe, you know, if I stand, I had a walking stick, and if I just, if I stood just so and looked at my shadow, I was a grunt with a rifle and a pack. Mm -hmm. Or if I looked up at that hill that followed that trail, I could see, you know, a line of soldiers going through the woods. So that really brought some of it back to me. But that was focusing on the trail. And this, this led, this book is really going back to the original purpose. I want to tell what Vietnam was about. And in this case, well, you know, this is my story. It's unique. Uh, it's not a great story of heroism or anything like that. It's just what happened to one person. Well, and you chose an interesting title, Reluctant Soldier. Right. Yeah, I didn't want to yeah, do it. An Uneasy Veteran. Yeah. How did you happen to choose that title? Uh, it pretty much came to me as I was thinking about it. Well, I didn't want to go in the service. And I'm, I did. And then I've always felt uneasy about it. You know, even at the time, I had questions about it, but I did. You know, I went over there, and you know, I was carrying a rifle, and I pulled the trigger. So I'm not, well, I'm You're still not. You're an infantryman in yeah. a rifle uh, unit. Yeah. yeah. So I'm still, at the, you know, even now, that's kind of a duality. It's like, yeah, I went there. I, should be, I want to be proud of my service. But on the other hand, proud of my service in a war that is very questionable. So it, I have that yin and yang, and I don't. And I thought someday, I always thought someday I would, I would, that would all be resolved. And I now know it's not. Well, what was your writing process this time? And maybe that might have been different than their first book. Yeah, I mean, some degree they're very similar, which is just getting things down on paper. But for this, I'd been writing. Like I said, I started in the mid '70s, writing my just my recollections, my thoughts about the war. Uh, just getting it down on paper. Well, I still remembered it. I did not keep a journal when I was in, in the military. So I had to think about, okay, what happened? And of course, after all these years, those, some of those memories are, did that really happen like that? I mean, I had to, had to really parse through and think about why do I think, why do I want, think that story is important? Why do I think it's real? And on some of them, I thought, you know, all I know is I just heard about this. Well, and um, you're drawing memories that are 50 years old almost 50 yeah almost 50 yeah some of those memories are pretty well burned into my brain <laughs> well you know we're both independent accredited va claims agents and you and i have noticed that veterans who have ptsd often get triggered in the process of documenting mm -hmm. their va claims you know the va makes it like how do you know you have you know ptsd and then in recalling the actual event that sets off the thing, and so they go into a whole program like improving I have PTSD, you gave me another issue of PTSD. Did that happen to you as you were writing this book? Uh, somewhat. I mean, that's one reason why the book has been so, so long in coming. And even this, this round, I started, actually I started this particular round of writing in 2014. So it's 2019. So it took four years to get this together. And some of that was you know, just putting it together, having people read it, staying away from it, and coming back to it. And part of that is just there's some reluctance to even put the story out. You know, somehow I think, well, nobody's going to care, or maybe people are going to think I was a fool. But I would had this compulsion that you know, I really do want to tell the story. Well, as you were writing the story, were you right back in the jungle in Vietnam? Sometimes. Sometimes. Yeah. Other times, I, yeah. For much of it, I could be pretty dispassionate. Some of the, uh, you know, the book contains a narrative. It also contains some of the blog posts. The blog posts were kind of like real time. You know, I wrote those thinking this is, I could feel more in, 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 the, in the, I guess, in the time, at, uh, the experience. Uh, so the narrative was a little bit more, a little bit more removed, but it's all still pretty close. Well, Mark, this is a program for Veterans Hour sponsored by Veterans for Peace. And you've been very active since I've known you in Veterans for Peace. How did you happen to uh, choose this organization? Um, they were there when, uh, you know, during the uh, Iraq War. I, I did not know about Veterans for Peace. I, was a, I, was, I knew about Vietnam Veterans Against the War yes. because they had, they had had their uh, famous Dewey Canyon Three event while I was in Vietnam. So seeing, you know, fellow uh, veteran, fellow service members speaking out against the war was electrified while I was in country. So 
I, in fact, when I discovered they still existed in, uh, I think it was like mid 80s, you know, I joined that. But that was you know, somewhat removed. They weren't as active. And in 2002, with the uh, Iraq War, I met Veterans for Peace in, when I was living in Phoenix. And you know, we, we were very active in opposing the war. And when I came to Olympia, followed, just found the, found the chapter here. I see. Well, I know that uh, Veterans for Peace is a very active, somewhat smaller group, but still very active in the fact that we have a radio program, we have a television program. Uh, I know you uh, participate uh, weekly in vigils, mm -hmm. so and uh, letters to the editor. Uh, just recently, one of our members, Larry Kirshner, is a Polish poet. He just came back from a poetry reading. Right. So we're really a pretty active yeah. group. You know, I had a chance to read the book, Mark, and I know that there are some things that you left out. Um, what got left out, and why did you choose yeah. to leave it out? Primarily, they, I couldn't quite come up with enough to say about it. And some things that I left out were, you know, as I was writing this, well, I read books when I was in Vietnam. Uh, we all carried something to read, and it was everything from, you know, as up uplifting as Love Story, which was p popular that year, mm -hmm. and you could always tell who in the unit was reading it because they were crying. Uh, um, and it went all the way down to pornography. I mean, it was every, every, anything you could get to read, people had. So I read, but I couldn't really remember the books. I just remembered that they were there. So I, it was, other than saying I read books, I couldn't think of much. So I just didn't really go there. But that was an important part of the experience being in the field. Uh, the other thing, and I didn't, didn't really think about this as I was writing it. It came about pretty much when I had the manuscript done. The idea that the war didn't exist in 1971. And in 1971, Richard Nixon was withdrawing the troops. Uh, the war was winding down. So people didn't think there was a war going on. Uh, when I came home on leave, it was like, you know, people that knew me knew the war was going on, but for the most part, it was like invisible. Yeah, what war? And if I, yeah, and just to get, if you're doing any research on this, you know, I would look through the history of the war. Okay, what happened in 1971? And most of what I see, they're talking about uh, the big issue, you know, one of the big events was the uh, South Vietnamese Army's incursion into Laos, Lam Song 519. But, you know, American troops weren't, we were just patrolling the jungle. You know, we weren't really doing, you know, it doesn't show up. Uh, the Ken Burns series, you see, uh, you go through all those years of the war, you get to 1971, and about the only thing I can recall seeing is the image of, a bunch of guys smoking pot through a uh, shot, either a shotgun or M16. I've forgotten which mm -hmm, it was, mm -hmm. and it was that was probably very true of the year, but that seems to be all there was to it. So there's that feeling that by '71 people had kind of forgotten that the war was going on, which was part of Nixon's plan. Yeah, well, I noticed you mentioned the Ken Burns film, and we in Veterans for Peace have had some commentary on mm -hmm. what the film said and what it didn't say. Yeah. And I thought in many respects, I mean, some of the voices that he brought to the, brought to the, to the air were very, very effective, especially many of the Vietnam veterans against the war. I mean, people talking about those very live experiences they had. So I think it brought that home. I thought the part I found most disconcerting was the juxtaposition between what seemed like the brave American boys, you know, always, you know, holding up, firing the machine guns over their head. And then the, the anti-war people partying back at home. And it just seemed to be a very unfavorable uh, comparison. Mm -hmm. And I think that tends to leave people with the idea that the anti-war movement was hostile to GIs, and it wasn't. You know, nobody in the anti-war movement ever you know, spoke ill, you know, unkindly to me because I was a soldier. In fact, in many respects, I've been welcomed because I bring that voice. I mean, that, and well, that's I, why we say we have an authentic yes. voice. And I've said this, and mentioned it in the book, and I've said this any number of times, you know, speaking out against war is what gives meaning to my service. Matter of fact, I, I remember you were asked in a vigil in Olympia mm -hmm. uh, about your service. Oh, she th and, uh, thank you for my service. Thank you thank for you your service. service. And I said, well, this is my service. <laughs> <laughs> this is when my service began. Yeah. So that, you know, that's meaningful to me. 
Uh, anything else that I left out? Yeah. Talk well, about. let's let's say as you read the book, you will see some authentic GI language. Yes. But we won't use all that GI language now. You may substitute a word or so. Yes. But it is in the book, and it is authentic. It's how we talked. That is indeed. Well, Mark, you were a new college graduate. You actually did college, uh, graduate from college. So how did you land up in the Army, and particularly even at Oakland Army Terminal? Well, basically, you know, it was... By the time I graduated from college, I didn't. Well, I knew I didn't want to go in for three or four years, so that that cut out everything but the army. And I, I made the made that calculated decision. Oh, I'm going to go for two years. So I just you know, put my head down and said, "Okay, I'm just going to go through and get this done." Plus, I was also thinking, you know, I I, I want GI benefits. You know, oh I, yes. I was thinking of going for a master's degree, so getting. G the GI Bill was important. So all that led me to join in, and join the Army, and say, okay, get this out of the way, and ended up in Oakland Army Terminal on my way to Vietnam because that's, those were the orders I got. I, they said, uh, you're going to be a, a light weapons infantryman, and it's, they didn't say, and then you're going to Vietnam, but I've forgotten how many people in my company there were, but I can only think of like one or two guys that did not get orders to Vietnam. So it was an Oakland Army terminal was a warehouse where they shipped us through. Yes, indeed. Well, a lot of college graduates actually became officers, but you chose not to become an officer. What was your rationale? Well, part of it was they chose, uh, they were not uh, really taking officers. Actually, I applied for Naval OCS, and that was three years. I figured, okay, if I'm going to go in for three years, that might be but I didn't get in. Mm -hmm. uh, by 1970, you had all these people who had taken ROTC. So, and, and now the Army is withdrawing troops. They're downsizing, so suddenly they don't need as many. Uh -huh. So when I went into basic training, you know, that wasn't even an option. They did offer me the opportunity to go to you know, Warrant Officer Flight School and become a helicopter pilot, uh, which actually in some respects would have been kind of cool, but it would also have been very dangerous. Yes. And it would have been four years, and I, wasn't really, I just didn't want to do that. Well, I was also given the choice, like, do you want to be an infantry army officer, or do you want to be a Marine Corps infantry <laughs> officer? And I said, those are my two choices because of my college background? And they said, yes. So that's when I said, no, I will enlist, not be an officer. In my case, I, I took my trombone and auditioned uh, in the, for the Army Band, and I was given um, a guaranteed um, MOS, Military Occupation Specialty, and they said I could choose any post for a year. You know, this was 66. Uh, that was a pretty good bet for me if I was given yeah. a year somewhere other than Vietnam. Being in Vietnam in 1966 and 7 was a much different proposition than it was for me in 1971. Well, and then even in 68 with yeah. the Tet Offensive. Yeah. And in fact, the one thing my college deferment did for me is it moved me to the end of the war when casualties were dropping. So in, I think 68 was the, was the deadliest year. That was it like was the deadliest 60, year. 16,000 Americans yes, were killed. Yes, So by the time I, in 1971, we had 2,400. So that's a big drop, but that's still 200 a month. Yeah. And my unit had, let's see, I think we had 28 casualties. It's the numbers in the book, but it was not a whole lot. And my company was very fortunate in that we did not have anyone killed in action. Uh, we had a couple guys killed in accidents, and we had a bunch of guys wounded, but nobody, no KIAs. No hostile yeah. KIAs. But every other battalion got, had KIAs. You know, uh, on the opening credits, we zero in on the Washington's wall. Mm -hmm. And one of those, and the reason I zeroed in on that is one of my uh, friends that, you know, uh, was in the same Sunday school as I was, uh, became a an infantry officer, and he was killed very early, early on. 
So, you know, I use that wall to remind me, uh, you know, that that's what happened to him. Um, page 40 in your book, Mark, you, uh, you describe an infantry platoon in full fire. Tell our audience, what does full fire mean? Well, full fire is basically when we open up on somebody. <clears throat> and what that, what that was, and I, is we, had, we, were, we were on patrol, and we had two Vietnamese walk into us. And somebody yelled, they're out there, and suddenly we opened up. And if you, li if you like, I'll read you a, f a small section Would you? There. Yeah. Yes. Make sure I can find it here, page 46. Oh, that was the Claymore fire you're going to be talking about then, huh? On 46? Yeah, it's, oh, it's page 40. That's right. Page 40, yeah. There you go. So, yeah, so it's an infantry platoon in full fire is an unforgettable experience. The noise was deafening with the, cr with the crack of rifles and the heavy thud of the machine gun. Small brush was swept away by the initial fire, as if our purpose was to clear the area. As the firing continued, small trees began to fall, bullets shattering their trunks. When the ceasefire was called after about 30 or 45 seconds, the air was thick with the acrid smell of spent gunpowder. A patrol went out to look for bodies. The rest of us regrouped. The patrol returned with a report of blood trails, but no bodies. Whoever it was, they got away. There were two Vietnamese carrying packs, prime targets in a free fire zone. Amazing, with all that firepower unleashed in their direction that they weren't killed. I mean, so a full fire didn't kill them. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was 45, 45 seconds of, I don't know how many of us there were firing, 15 or 20, including a machine gun, and somehow they got away. I'm so you, what, you were part of the group that was firing yes. at the time, but you didn't know at what, you were just firing. Yeah, I was actually, I was remembering my training, you know, looking down the sights, sh firing, and suddenly realized, I don't have a target. <laughs> so at that point, I put it on automatic and just started firing bursts. And that was my one and only time firing a rifle. Well, you also talk about a different fire on page 46, a Claymore fire. What was the purpose of a Claymore? What, what is it? Okay, a Claymore is an anti-personnel mine. Uh, it's about, I've forgotten, a couple pounds of plastic explosive and I think 800 uh, steel ball bearings and it fires out like a shotgun and they're set up as perimeter defense and they're com you command detonate them. And you can aim <clears throat> it in a certain direction right. so it fires so, the balls so every in night, that direction. So every night we would, you know, as soon as we set up our, our perimeter we'd go out and put our claymores out and then at dusk we would put a trip Trip wire in and front that was of to perfect, uh, protect your, your group. Yeah, so if somebody was coming, they would hit the trip wire, and whoever was on radio watch would then fire the claymore. So, so the trip wire didn't fire the claymore. Right. That was just a warning, like, oh, better fire the claymore. And you then, know, why don't you read a little bit from page 46 there on, on that yeah. claymore? And then also, one of the things that we found is either, I've forgotten for exactly if they were stealing our claymores or just turning them around. And if they turned them around, you'd think they'd pop, the pop a flare and have us fire it back at us, but that never happened. So, so they decided, well, this, we'll fool them. We'll put a trip flare under. So when you put out your claymore, you dig a little depression, put the trip flare under it. It worked kind of like a grenade. You pull the pin, set the claymore on top of it to hold the spoon on, and if so somebody picks it up. the pressure of it. Yeah. So we do that and then go out and put out the other ones at night. So this is, uh, this took place in April. So this is, by this time, early April, Vietnam was well into the dry season. Not only was it hotter than hell, but the jungle was tinder dry. One evening we went out to place our trip, flare, trip flares and wires in front of the claymores, and someone knocked over a claymore, setting off the flare underneath and exciting, igniting a small brush fire. As we scrambled to put out the the fire, my squad leader, Charlie Brown, spotted the overturned mine in the middle of the fire and yelled for us to take cover. The mine exploded as soon as he gave the warning. Fortunately, it was lying face down, so all the shrapnel and blasts went into the ground. When the smoke cleared, my squad leader was knocked silly and his eardrums were blown out. Mm. Another squad member, Jackie, also suffered ear damage. They were both medevaced. 
Charlie Brown spent the remaining weeks of his tour shuttling mail from Benoit to whatever fire base we're on. I never heard what became of Jackie. But that's, you know, we had any number of accidents, and that, that was a fairly mild one. Well, I think I remember in the book that you picked up a grenade and brought it back somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do, do tell me what was in your mind uh, when you did that. Well, I figured I can't just look. I went out to put up my claymore, and here's an American grenade laying on the ground. Was that sort of the pineapple one? Or, or well, it's kind of a baseball one? one. Baseball, okay. And the pin had been pulled. But grenades have safeties, and they had not taken the safety off. Ah. So, you know, very intelligent me that, oh, I can't leave this leg there, but it could be booby trapped. So I get, get a stick, and I get down below it, so if it goes off, it won't blast at me. And I poke at it, and it doesn't go off. Now, of course, had it gone off, it would have blown my eardrums out, maybe knocked me silly. And, so now I take it back to my sergeant, and let's just say that he was not pleased. Uh, I don't think, well, I don't know if he really yelled at me I in the jungle. I understand. You know, my drill instructor didn't uh, appreciate my lack of physical prowess on throwing grenades. Mm -hmm. uh, apparently, I didn't throw it far enough, and we all had to duck. I had that. But the, one, the thing about that experience, I thought, in the end, that was probably, he, after... He'd yelled at me. He came back a little bit later that evening, and he, he didn't quite apologize, but he said, I want to make sure you know that not to do that. And <laughs> I, I thanked him. You know, and that was really the first time I can remember anybody in the Army actually caring about me individually. You know, the rest of the time, I was just another, another soldier, just another piece of the, piece of the puzzle. So that actually is a strange, strangely uh, positive. And to this day, I don't pick up anything that I don't have to. <laughs> and sometimes I wonder, well, is there a booby trap under there? How long were you in country before you reconciled the fact that you're in Vietnam, not Virginia? Uh, pretty much from the day I got there. I mean, yeah, it was totally unlike anything I had. Surprisingly, the jungle that, that I was in looked a lot like Virginia. It was just woods. It wasn't really, didn't seem like a tropical jungle. I mean, we were in the mountains. Oh, so you're higher up where it was yeah. a little cooler, not little. quite as sweaty hot. It was hot enough. Hot <laughs> yeah. enough, yeah. yeah. Quite. I, <coughs> the, one, but, <coughs> excuse me. the one guy that I've kept up with talks about the, how many mountains that we climbed that weren't on the map. You know, we didn't know, just suddenly we're going up, then we're going down. And it was just really an endurance issue. Hmm. You just had to keep going. Mark, on uh, page 93 was probably the most poignant thing that I came across, where you said, these days, and that means right now. Right now. Uh, I don't often think of responding with an automatic weapon, <laughs> but I can't shake the reflexes and thought patterns I learned in the Army. Learning to kill is a lesson that never goes away. What did you mean when you wrote that? Because that's pretty heavy hitting. Uh, basically that. I mean, once you, at least for me, once I was taught how to kill someone, it, I, I, that's, I can't unlearn it. And it's always disturbed me that those thoughts come up. And you know, during the 80s, you know, particularly they were talking about how all Vietnam vets were psychotic. I kept thinking, well, is it, am I going to do something? Am I going to act this out? I mean, I, it, yeah, I mean, fortunately, a psychologist convinced me that, no, you haven't, you know, the thoughts are there, but you're not acting on them. So I pretty much just realized, yeah, I'm not going to actually do it. But, I mean, those thoughts still come about. Well, you know, we're both claims agents, and we assist veterans with their claims. And they deal with a lot of those mm -hmm. issues themselves. I remember someone saying that he... He heard a, a car was slowing down ahead of him, and he reached in the glove box and pulled out a, a pistol. Yeah. His wife was with him, and you know, kept saying, "We're that, on the freeway. Yeah, we're, I, we're we're just leaving Olympia. We're in the states. We're in the states. Yeah. You know, and, and all of a sudden, oh my, you know, and so he closed it. But it scared his wife, mm -hmm. you know, and and it was part of the thing. Like if there's a bang or 
if there's a car pulled over to the side, why is it yeah. over to the side? Have you ever had those issues? Not quite so much. I mean, if partially because all of my combat experience was in the jungle. So being on the street, it's a different reaction. Uh, it's less, I guess, less visceral in the sense when I see somebody, I think, well, is this person going to attack me? It's much more of a, a sort of, I got an idea than a, kind of a gut feeling that it's going to be yes. Whereas, you know, so a lot of the guys that dealt, uh, you know, in Iraq or, you know, had urban fighting, you know, that comes back with them. And I can say, and it's, I can think of a veteran I've been working with lately, you know, who's dealing with all that. Uh, he has anger management issues and has difficulty being in crowds. And his wife described trying to take, you know, trying to go to an arcade, which is something he enjoyed. But mm. when he got into that crowd, it was too agitated. Couldn't be in the crowd. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm, I'm really very fortunate in that regard, given the, you know, I had, I had a combat experience, but I didn't get, you know, have the terror that so many people did have. Yeah. Well, and, and then being in confined spaces, I remember one veteran that we both worked with uh, before, that when he got in my car, I rolled up the windows, and then I noticed his breathing got real heavy, mm -hmm. and then he started making noises and whatnot, and I realized, oh my, um, part of his experience was he was in a confined space, and that has affected him yeah. all of his life, and he started having a panic attack. Yeah. I mean, I, wrote, I was mentioned in the book, just I was walking home from work one day and a car came up behind me and I knew it wasn't somebody trying to assassinate me, but that thought was in my brain. And when they slowed down ahead of me. Something's wrong. Yeah. I mean, I, I figured, okay, this is Why somebody, is he slowing down? This is somebody looking for an address, but that thought is cir cir you know, circulating in my brain. And those things, you know, it's 50 years later, that has not gone away. Well, in page 110, you wrote, perhaps the biggest discovery on this round of writing about Vietnam is realizing that I have not forgiven my country for war in Vietnam. Right. When will you have ever be able to do that? Probably when we stop making war in other countries. You know, I, I, I could, I, you know, I think I've come to terms with my service in Vietnam and all that went around there. And if that was all there was to it, it wouldn't be so high in my, in my consciousness. But we've been at war pretty much in some, one form or another ever since Vietnam. And certainly in the past 17 years, I mean, we've been you know, a whole period of war where we do have casualties coming back. So as long as we're still doing that, we really haven't changed. We haven't learned the lesson. Yeah, and that's, so, yeah, my, my, I would say, I think, I think we've settled accounts for Vietnam, but we continue on with, with our militarism, with our involvement in other, uh, interventions in other countries, and using military force rather than diplomacy. Right. Rather than, and you know, we see that coming up with Venezuela, don't yeah. we? So, and it seems like that's just an ongoing pattern. So, I, you know, when, when we stop doing that, I could be at ease. There you go. But that's, but I hadn't really thought of that uh, because especially, you know, for so, so many years after I came out, after I left the service, other than applying for GI, GI Bill, I, I had no thought about VA benefits. And then since I got off the Appalachian Trail, I've actually used VA benefits. And so, yeah, that's, I, I appreciate that. So I should, it, you know, they're, they're at least making some attempt to deal with what, my, what the effect of Vietnam was on me, but we're not really making that broader uh, a pr attempt to stop the militarism. And that's what that's I find. True. It took, it got us into Vietnam, and it seems to be continue uh, to this day. I know many veterans our age have hearing issues because of their experience mm -hmm. in, in Vietnam. Yep, and I'm, I'm right up there with them. I mean, I would... We were on a fire base with three uh, 105 millimeter howitzers. We had helicopters. We had small arms fire. So we had plenty of things to make noise and no air protection. Yeah. And so you land up with hearing issues, uh, tinnitus, which is that mm -hmm. buzzing ringing in the ears that uh, can be persistent or it comes and it goes. Yeah. And in fact, I didn't even know about tinnitus until I started working 
with the car. I guy. remember that. I remember that. I mean, yeah. they started describing it. I said, well, I've got that. Yeah. You know, and mine just sort of comes and goes, and I'm thinking, how could that possibly be? I was a bandsman. Yeah, right behind the percussion <laughs> drum section, you know, and, uh, uh, and then they would fly us in these helicopters where the uh, tail used to be down, so you had that jet engine noise. Oh, yeah, the Chinooks? The Chinooks, yeah. So they would move our whole uh, band from one place to another. But, you know, after a while, you know, it almost made us go deaf. I mean, it was just... If you're around aircraft, it's, I mean, they are definitely noisy. Well, and we come across that with uh, veterans, too, or were, did you, were you around uh, noise issues that you didn't have adequate ear protection. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, one of the ads on TV now is saying, if you were issued this ear plug, you know, there's a lawsuit yeah. now because it was not adequate for what it was supposed to do. And I think as far as you're know, talking about other veterans, any, you know, anybody that was in the military that was around any equipment around loud noises probably has a, val you know, a very valid basis for making a claim for tinnitus. Even on engine repair. Yeah. Yeah. I think you, we had someone, uh, he was around generators. He was, he was, he was a medic. But he, he was, was a medic, yes, yeah. matter of fact. Uh, and, and he had to have hearing aids mm -hmm. because he couldn't hear to do his job. And, um, you know, that part was being denied. But, and tonight, as we had to go, but he finally got that yeah. coverage. Uh, indeed. And when I applied for tinnitus, it was almost just, yeah, I went in for a hearing test. And they said, yes, you have it. Yeah, and, and basically on tonight's, you just have to say, I'm sick and tired of this buzzing, mm -hmm. ringing in the ears, because there's no equipment that they can test to hear what we yeah. hear inside our head. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's a very... And, what really, and what really makes a claim like that uh, credible is, you know, you look at your, your military occupational specialty. So if you had equipment repair, infantry, artillery, yeah. uh, probably armor with the, the noise of, of the uh, machinery, all those things, you know, just by saying that you were around it and yeah, that was involved, my military occupation that, specialty. That does establish a very strong basis, and we've done, we've gotten uh, done claims for veterans that have been succeeded based on that. And even if it's not in their records, we have a thing called a sworn yeah. statement, a sworn affidavit statement, saying I swear under penalty of perjury that the following is true, which says if you catch me lying, I know I'm going to yeah. prison. And actually, that's one thing. Uh, that when I talk about giving meaning to my service is doing the veterans work. Yes, because you know, that's, that's how you happen to go in. That's where I first actually met you up at uh, Coffee Strong, right. I believe. Well, we were in the chapter before that, but when yeah. we started doing that, it's something, I'm not sure where I got the idea to, to be a claims agent. And part of it is, well, I, I just walked into VA and applied. And I had, you know, I just said, I was in the service, you know, here's my record, I want to apply for, apply for disability compensation, and, you know, bing, bing, bing. It's like, took three months, was, which was amazing compared to what it became. That was right before the Iraq War when the claims, claim time jumped. Oh, yes. But then when uh, people are coming back now, uh, you know, they, had, they don't, may not have records, so we try to get them, you know, fill in the full, you know, fill that in with what records they do have, and like I say, doing the, doing the statements. And that's where having, you know, we, we, unfortunately we make, you know, you, we pretty much have to have the veteran relive it. And for me it wasn't yeah. too bad, because uh, I dealt with it on the, on the Appalachian Trail. Uh, and I'd pretty much come to terms with it. You know, I, I know I can't change, I can't change what I did. What I can always change is how I, how I use that in the future. And that's how, I, that's what made me think, this would be something I could do because I spent my entire career uh, working in government. I know process, I know documentation. So I can put together a pretty good uh, case you know, if, if we have the records. And sometimes when we don't have a, a record, we can still do a pretty good case. Well, a lot of the veterans do not get adequate instruction of how do you do all these things. Mm -hmm. And so they fill something out and then all of a sudden, denied. Yeah. And so then, well, okay, I give up. Yeah, and, and yet they've earned those benefits. And, you know, and that's where having, having some, uh, a veterans advocate to work with you. And you get, there are different levels. I mean, we've done it both ways where we did all the paperwork and everything like that. And we also found out that is just 
overwhelming. These days, we're more like, if you want to file a claim, here's what you need to do. Here's the, here's the kind of evidence you need. Here's, you know, some things we can help them find, other things they need to go back and get their records, but we can help them assemble, you know, say, yes, this is the kind of information you, would, uh, you need to make the claim. Here's how you want to put together so we can help them package it. And that way, and also we know all right off when a veteran comes in, if you think you're going to file a claim, then you file what's called an intent to file. Because it might take you six months, but if you file that intent to file, that sets your effective date for any award of benefits. From when that paper was yeah. received by the VA. Well, now if uh, people want to file a claim, they have a couple of choices. They could go to the Lacey Veterans Hub where mm -hmm. they're people there that'll help with their claims, or they could go to the Washington Department of Veterans Affairs where right. they have people that will help them file their, their claims. Um, you published several stories in your blog, and I believe it was called Unsolicited Opinion? Yes. Do you still have that blog uh, available for people if they want to uh, yep. look at it? Uh, it's still there. <laughs> It's still up. It's not very active. I pretty much stopped blogging when I was writing this because that's where all my time went. Every now and then I post something. But there is a lot in that. And like in 2005 and 2006 is when I started really coming back and putting some of that stuff into, the, uh, in, into writing. And I published some of those in here. It somewhat duplicates what's in the narrative. Mm -hmm. And the difference is the, the blog posts are more, uh, more detailed. And I thought, yeah, I don't really want to go into all that detail in the narrative. I want to keep the narrative moving. But then I had these other pieces, and it also allowed me to add some, uh, some of the follow-up, too, which was returning to Vietnam in uh, 2010. You did go there. I remember yeah. that. And you took your partner, Maggie, with right. you, too. And you, you taught English, didn't you? Right. Uh, well, we didn't teach so much. We were we call ourselves conversational resources in the um, English language department at Da Nang University. Aha. So what we were, we were native English speakers talking to people who had learned English from Vietnamese instructors. And suddenly here we are with our accents and our strange usage. And they realized that talking to a native English speaker is very difficult. But it was, it, it was, it made a big difference. I think that's it was a, a good counterbalance to the experience of, of the war because coming back to Vietnam and seeing it at peace and meeting the Vietnamese, because I never met any Vietnamese in Vietnam when I was there. Mm. And I wanted nothing to do with them because, well, they're all going out to out to kill me. Yeah. At least that's how, that's how I, treated, I, I, I treated them, just like, okay. And I had every reason to think they would want to kill me because I'm over there trying to kill them. In yeah. Fact, I, you were the one that invaded their country. Yeah, and I, I'm pretty sure at the time I thought this, and I do now, is that they had more right to kill me than I did them. Yeah. One of our VFP members, Larry Kirshner, is also a Vietnam veteran mm -hmm. like yourself and also a published poet. You end your book with some poems that you wrote, Mark. Mm -hmm. Would you share some of those poems with us now? Sure. Actually, there are a couple that I would do. Yes, please do. So this one's called Generations. Uh, so My Uncle Cy was one of the heroes who fought the good war against Hitler. He flew the big bombers that were at once so terrifying and so vulnerable. His war was no high-tech circus, just raw courage of men risking their lives over and over in the European skies. So I came back to a grateful country and went to work to provide for his family. But the war never left him, as if anyone can ever forget that experience. He knew the price of freedom, and he watched with anger as his generation's children refused to accept that burden without question. I was one of those children who asked, what freedom, what freedom and patriotism had to do with killing peasants in the jungles and villages and rice paddies of Vietnam? Ho Chi Minh was no Hitler. His troops were no panzers aimed at the heart of America. But Tsai saw it differently by God. He had risked his life because America had failed to fight the Nazis early on. So he could not understand how the children whose freedom he fought to protect did not see the danger of godless international communism. 
Whatever my questions, I too became a warrior, though not with the certitude and dedication of Sai and his comrades. I simply allowed myself to be taken into the military machine and risked my life, not as a hero, but as a complacent soldier, fighting a war I did not believe in. Somehow I survived and returned, not to a grateful nation. No gratitude was expected. After all, my efforts had little to do with any life in America other than my own. My return was simply the chance to begin living again. Years later, Cy told me how angry he was that Jimmy Carter had granted amnesty to draft dodgers and deserters. They took the easy way out, he said. Amnesty is a slap at you and all the other brave boys who had the courage to serve their country. The gulf between our generations loomed large in that, mo that statement. True, we both knew the fear and terror that is a soldier's real companion. So Cy thought I was patriotic like him because I too had served. But I wasn't patriotic. I was just too scared not to fight. I told Cy that I took the easy way out, that resisting the draft and deserting required the courage, and risk, uh, the courage to risk social disapproval and often years of exile. Serving in the military was acceptable and only cost me a couple of years. Cy had never thought about military service in that way. He was surprised that a veteran could think such thoughts. I don't think I changed his mind, but I know that I shook his certainty in that very small way cracked the wall between two generations. Mm -hmm. And that was, that was the difference. I mean, it, it was, uh, you know, he had a very different view of it. And Cy was your... Cy, Cy was uh, my, uh, married my mother's sister. Uh -huh. he, was, he was an Air Force, he was a navigator. And I don't have many missions he flew over Europe, but if you know anything about that, about the bombing runs, that was pretty terrifying work. Yes. Why don't you share another poem with us? Okay. This one's called Comrade. I never really knew him, but he has been my companion for many years. Someone said he was a jerk. I can't say. All I know is that our brief time together left a lasting impression. You see, I saw him die. Mm. His death was not dramatic or heroic, just dumb. An accident in a war filled with many accidents. The difference was that I saw it happen. I saw him die. He fell out of a helicopter that was his ticket to safety, a medical evacuation for a minor cut. Hardly even a wound. It was a convenient excuse to get out of the jungle. But nobody expected him to die. We watched him rising toward the chopper, envying his good fortune, each of us wishing, wishing that we were ascending in his place. The chopper's big rotor slapped the air as it hovered above the mountainside, its turbine screaming, waiting to carry him back to safety. I saw the medic leaning out of the door. I saw the medic reach out to pull him in. I saw him put his feet on the skids, and I saw him fall away from the chopper. He fell abruptly, violently, no slow-mo effect, no eternity to reach the ground, just a rapid free fall and a bone-crunching thud. Mere seconds ended his life at 19. His buddies wrapped him in a poncho and hooked him to the cable again. This time he made it, boots pointing upward as they disappeared into the open door. But this time was too late. The chopper carried away a corpse leaving us our thoughts, black and evil. No one wanted to trade places with him now. All these years I remembered his fall and seen his body break upon that mountain. All these years his death has been my companion. I did not know him well, but he remains with me still. Even now, all I know is that I saw him die. That seems to be more than enough. Well, poems can be pretty powerful yeah. to the writer as well as the listener. And that was, you know, that's, he, he was the only person I saw die. And all things considered, that's probably not too bad, but still, I mean, it left still a very strong... seared in your memory. Yeah. And to, by way of a little explanation, as we were on the side of a hill, so a chopper couldn't land and we couldn't put him in. So they hoisted him up on a cable, mm -hmm. and cable had a, had a hook with a safety catch on it, and the safety catch was broken. Uh. So when he put his feet on the skids, he just lifted himself out of that hook and back down. Well, Mark, our schools today get a lot of recruitment from the military coming in. What would you share with our young people who might be watching or listening to this program? I would say think very carefully about doing it and probably say, 
If you have another option, don't. Um, military has, they, it offers generous benefits, but it also comes at a cost. So if you're going in, I think, if anything, understand what you're doing, recognize the risk, and talk some, to talk some veterans, veterans or people who have been in. I mean, for some people, it might be a, it might be a good fit. Um, but again, the purpose of the military is to kill and destroy. And even if you're a clerk sitting behind a desk doing something pretty innocuous, the whole point is somebody, you're supporting somebody whose job is to kill and break things. As a matter of fact, one of the people who sat behind a desk was a clerk. He's 100% disabled, you know, and we both worked with him, mm -hmm. you know. Um, now, my clerking wasn't that bad. I mean, no. Just had to put up with more BS than well, I Well, and like. you and I both benefited in the fact that we could go to graduate school afterwards with our GI Bill mm -hmm. benefits type of thing, but it came at a price. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes I think, oh, my master's degree was paid, paid for by the, with blood of Vietnamese people. That's pretty heavy. Well, Mark, as we bring our program to an end, we have the book now available. Yes. The Reluctant Soldier, Uneasy Veteran, A Year in Vietnam and Beyond. How do people go about getting this book today? Uh, well, if you, are, if you are in Olympia, you can go to either Orca Books or Browser's Bookstore. They're, they have copies, and I would encourage you to do that because they're very nicely carrying it for me, so I'd like to give them some business. If you're not in Olympia or can't get to Orca or Browser's, you can go to uh, my website, which is uh, www.reluctantsoldier.com, and you'll see some excerpts and some photo from the book, some photos from my time in Vietnam. Uh, there's a review of the book, and there's also an order form. So you can go there, and click on that, fill it out, and I'll get the message and send you one. And according to this book, it's $17.95. Right. And if you're in, like I say, if, if, if you're in, in Washington, I have to sell add sales tax to that, but if you're outside of Washington, it's just shipping. What do you plan to do with Veterans for Peace now that you've published your second book? Probably continue what we have been doing, which is more of these shows. Also continue doing the veterans, veterans advocacy and speaking out against war. One of the other things that we're doing uh, these days in particular, I want to mention, is VFP is a member of the Olympia Coalition Against uh, Nuclear Weapons. Yes, I did want to bring that up because you're very active yeah. on this whole issue that somehow we, we don't even think too much about. It's really interesting because it's, it's right up there with climate change in terms of being an existential threat because it is quite possible that you know, even a small exchange of nuclear weapons, say if India and Pakistan decide to exchange, say, 30 or 40 of their weapons, they will put out a cloud and contribute to a massive climate change. It might slow down global warming, but it's, not, it's going to come at a high cost. So it can affect human life. And if you, uh, if you read Daniel Ellsberg's new book, uh, The Doomsday Machine, you realize that much of what we've been told about nuclear weapons is, well, let's see, a lie. Let's put it that way. President has command and control. Uh, yes, he does, but actually a lot of other people do. And remember that, and remember that bomber commander and uh, Dr. Strangelove? Yes. It can actually flow all the way down to individual commanders. And D Daniel Ellsberg says after seeing the movie back in the 60s when he was a nuclear war planner, he said, this is not, this is a documentary. But that, you know, we don't seem to be really concerned about that these days, and yet we have a president and an administration that is pulling out of every treaty we've had, every yes. control, and the president wants to know why we don't use them. You know, and it is the obligation of every soldier to refuse illegal mm -hmm. orders. And we've pledged to defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign, foreign and, and domestic. domestic. And I don't want to make too strong a political statement, but I see a lot of domestic right yeah. in Washington, D.C. So, like I say, we've, you know, the chapter has signed on, you know, joined the coalition, and, you know, we've got a group here in Olympia that's working on doing outreach beyond, you know, just talking to the usual suspects. So we want to get out to some community. Well, and groups. we don't even think about nuclear that much, and no. yet right at 
Bangor, we have Trident uh, submarines. One of the largest concentrations on the planet of, on the, of nuclear Matter weapons fact, on the planet. Matter of fact, one of those submarines, there's enough uh, nuclear material to level every six inches of soil in the entire state of Washington, mm -hmm. and that's only on one. Yeah. And we have two VFP members now being held at Shannon, Ireland, because they went there to protest. And uh, they basically locked up our two VFP members. Yeah. We're still waiting for their release. And of course, our comrade Larry Kirshner was arrested at Bangor. On... Several times. Yeah. At least, just the one time. I one thought. time, yeah. yeah. And he yeah. had a federal thing. And, yeah. and there you couldn't uh, even say, I did this because. Yeah. They, it was they, almost a gag yes. order where you couldn't give the reason for why you did something. Exactly. Well, Mark, I want to thank you for being a part of our Veterans Hour this month and for sharing your second book. Oh, well, appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, well, thank you so much. And we want to thank uh, our Thurston Community Media for hosting our program so that we have an audience. We also put this program out on YouTube. And many times we uh, use the audio and, and present that over to Chaos Radio in Olympia so that we have a wide reach and we appreciate the resources. We want to thank our audience for participating in our chat together as we talk about a reluctant soldier and an uneasy veteran and my friend, Mark Fleming. Thank you, Mark. Thanks, Dennis.